you have to ask yourself some questions as you reflect on your last few trips to the sanctuary or ponder the next time you enter the sanctuary. Before the choir sang or the deacons prayed or the pastor gave a word from on high, what was your motivation? Did you enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, or did you wait for something to move you? Amen. Were you glad when they said unto you, let us go into the house of the Lord? Yes. Or did you just want to see what everybody had on? Have we put on our Christian uniforms, that we know how to dress up, to come out where others see us, but have we forgotten to put on the robe of righteousness? Amen. Amen. Are you clothed in his grace? Or have we put on a form of godliness and we're just denying the power of the cross? Do you hang around the cross? Or have you been crucified with Christ? When you can say, nevertheless, I live, yet not I live, but Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. The Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I live by the faith of the Son of God. We need to say that. I live by the faith of the Son of God. Because great is that faith. How much faith did he have? <clears throat> Can you see Jesus in the garden at Gethsemane? He was praying to the Father, knowing what he was to endure. He had to have faith that God would deliver him. He had to be in right relationship to know that although he would hang, bleed, and die, that God would ensure his resurrection. And that God wouldn't deviate from the plan or, like your friends, change his mind. That Father God would allow him to ascend and be seated at his right hand. The same spirit that had him rise from the dead is living and active and alive within us. We have been given the power to live right and to live eternally with our Father because of the faith of Jesus, who surrendered all, saying, not my will, but the uh, so in order for us to surrender all, we have to get in our own personal destiny. The work of the cross has already been completed, and we already have victory because of Christ. But to walk in the fullness of what he has for us, we need only to crucify the flesh. Mortify the deeds of the flesh so we can walk in the spirit and be all that God has called us to be. We have to cry out to our heavenly daddy and ask him to help us. We have to go into the garden and ask the Father to break up the foul ground of our hearts. We have to ask him to till up the old hurts, the old disappointments, yes. the old discouragement and the oppression. And as you break it up, Father God, up with the weeds of unforgiveness, yes. discord, yes. sin, iniquity. Yes. Ask him to rain down. Thank you, Father, for the rain. Rain down your living water so that we are fertile ground and able to produce fruit and a a healthy harvest that will bring glory to your name. Yes, yes. That's what we need to pray. That's what we need to pray because we are his children. He's given us the same advocate that raised Jesus from the dead. So we don't need to fret or fear. We're not losing anything when we give ourselves totally to Jesus, his will and his way. It's not really a sacrifice if you consider that all you're giving up is hell and eternal damnation. Yes. Condemnation in order to live victoriously in this present life and to live in the presence of the King eternally. So what I was saying, think about it. Did you come here hungry? Was your spiritual belly growling? I need some meat. Thank you, Lord, for the fast. Were you waiting to be fed the sincere meat of God's word? Were you thirsty and need some living water to revive your inner man? Did you become broken and needing to sense God's tangible touch? Reaching out to touch the hem of his garment. Wanting to experience corporate prayer and fellowship with those of precious like faith. When we come into his house, are we really expecting him to move? I know you came to hear the word of God, and I know you came to be edified, but in order to do so, it requires some self-reflection. You have to ask yourself, Am I truly a child of God? Or am I just one of those church people? You can say that you were his because you were created by him 
for him, but can you truly call yourself him? Have you received the Spirit of God whereby you can call Abba Father? Abba. Abba. Do you yes. walk in the light as he is in the light? Yes. So as I say this, let's look at some differences between children of God and church folk. Children of God, they not only hear and know the voice of God, but they also obey him. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, yes. and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and I know them, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Yes. But God's children hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord their God. They love the Lord, and they serve him with all their heart and all their soul. Now Jesus also said, those who love me keep my commandments. So now the sin of Adam, so a grace of him, excuse me, should sin much more of him. Well, no. We've all sinned. We all know that. We've all sinned and what comes short of the glory of God. But we have to acknowledge that we've sinned. And acknowledge that we're sinners. And amen. Acknowledge that we do have a sin nature. But we have to put that sin nature under subjection to the glory of God. In order to get rid of that sin, though, we can't just talk about it and say, oh, I really can. We need to be real with God. We need to tell him just how good that thing felt to our flesh. Because our flesh liked it. But we have to expose the devil. We have to expose that fleshly nature so that God can change the work. So we have to tell him that we have to ask him continuously to just know that we have a heart to change. We have to ask the Savior to help us. We have to remember that true repentance is not just mouthing the words. So God knows your thoughts even before you think them. So we're only fooling ourselves if we keep, continue to walk outside of His plan for our lives. But you know we can't be like those church folk because you know what they say: God knows my heart. <laughs> yes, God knows your heart, and it's deceitfully wicked unless you ask Him. To change your heart to his heart. Okay. You have to ask him, ask him continuously to create in me a clean heart and renew the right spirit that's within me. Church folk, no, that's not us. They ignore the inner man, the Holy Spirit. His voice is heard in the word. The word is speaking to us, but we don't want to hear what he's speaking if we just don't want to hear. God said if he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Yes. We have to have an ear. Yes. We have to not keep it clogged up with the things of the world. We need to hear the word. We need to stop hearing the stuff that's on the radio and the stuff that's on the TV. We need to cleanse ourselves so we can be useful to the kingdom. Yes. As your faith grows, it will make you want to do what God wills for you. But how do you reach that plan of faith? If you build your faith on your own imaginations, you're just going to go wrong. So you have to let go of your own thoughts and take the thoughts of God. And where can we find the thoughts of God? But in the Word of God. You have the Word of God and it's enough. So we can't compare the Bible to other books because comparisons are dangerous. You can't say or think that this book contains the Word of God. It is the Word of God. Yes. It is supernatural in origin, eternal in duration, inexpressible in value. It's infinite in scope. It's regenerative in power. It's infallible in authority. It's universal in interest. It's personal in application. And it's inspired in totality. So we have to read it. Write it down in our hearts. We have to study it, work it out. And then we have to pack it up. So church folk, though, they go to and fro asking everybody, you know, la di da -di everybody, what should I do? What should I say? What should I think? And they get their answers from worldly sources instead of consulting God's instruction in their life. They reason without the Holy Spirit. And when they do that, they cause strife and sow discord among the brethren. We need to stay in the word. God's children, that's us, 
We commune with him through the word and prayer. We all know Joshua 1 7 says, Be strong and very courageous that they that thou might observe to do according to the law. Turn not from it to the right hand and to the left that thou may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart out of my mouth. You have to know that I say mine because I read the scripture back to myself and I put me in it. Because God told me this book is not just for somebody else. This is for me. Yes. So I insert Carla, or I insert me, or I insert me. Because God wants this to be personal, yes. intimate yes. with him. Yes. So I'm going to meditate on this book day and night, that I may observe to do all that is according to his will. And then I will make my way prosperous, and I will have good success. Because he said, have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid. Neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee wherever you go. Yes. Children of God hide the word of God in their hearts so they won't sin against them. They realize how powerful the word is. God's word is power. It's the agent by which he accomplishes his will here on earth. He created this world by his word. Men are born again by the word. First Peter 123 states that for you have not been born again, you have been, excuse me, you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and abiding word of God. The word will transform your mind, change your character, move you from grace to grace, and cause you to inherit the very nature of God. So God comes in, he dwells in, he talks through, he communicates with you, he communes with whoever opens up his whole being to the word of God and receives the spirit who inspired him. Children desire the sincere meat of the word, and they don't follow Christ strictly for the perceived benefits. They find that the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's what? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. They come to church to learn more and grow closer to God by attending Sunday school, Bible study, and prayer and praise. They want to come out and see Jesus, and they seek his hand. No, that's church. We came to seek his face. Yes. We came to lie before him and receive what it is that he has for us, but we came to serve him. Yes. Church folks, you know, they just desire the fish in the Lord. They long for the ride or the fried chicken. <laughs> now, children of God, even if they've only begun their Christian journey, they meditate on the word. If they've been a part of the body of Christ for any length of the time, they know that reading the word renews the mind and allows them to be one with Christ. And when Satan comes and rears that lead, what do they do? They pull out the word. Yes. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. They don't put Satan to flight. We need to be just like Jesus, say, it is written. Yes. Sometimes we don't even have to fight. We fight because we, for no reason. Yes. It is written. God said, that settles it. I am victorious. Yes. The battle's already won. Yes. I just need to keep the armor on because the devil's no busy. But I've got my armor on. What is the armor? Put it on. But make sure you carry that sword, which is the word. But now church folk, <laughs> they keep their Bibles in view of the public, you know, in the rear of their car window, <laughs> where the covers faded, was lying on the shelf, layers of dust, and they get angry with people. They get angry at whoever's preaching because they're hurting their feelings, or they're preaching at them. Well, they find reasons not to receive the fresh word of heaven for their lives by finding fault with the speaker. I remember her when she hmm, well. Come on. I remember me when I was. But I also have testimony that I know who God is. And yes. I have his <laughs> So we need to stop being in judgment so we can keep our children in the church. Yes. Yes. We need to stop acting like we got it right the first time. That's right. And that we're not Amen. still struggling with it.
you're showing them unruliness and disregard for the Lord, then we wonder why they don't follow. Amen. They don't want to go to church because you don't want to go to church. Amen. You busting and complaining because you got to get your suit out the cleaner. You busting because you can't stay up on Saturday night doing stuff you ought not be doing late in the midnight hour anyway. And your children are tired of sleeping in church and you mad at them for falling asleep. They bodies need some rest. Well, so, we need to teach our children to lay down and honor the Lord before they come to church. Amen. Go to bed on Saturday night. Some of our problems, we want to call the preacher, we want to call the deacons, we want to call everybody to help us because we got some problems late in the midnight hour. I'm going to tell you, don't call me late in the midnight hour. Go to bed. <laughs>
church folk murmur and complain about all the things they go on through, what is going on, why they don't succeed, wonder why they don't overcome their tribe, why be on the walls. They blame everybody. They blame the devil. They blame they blame their friends. They blame they don't even blame the enemies half the time. They just blame their friends. They blame the preacher. They blame the deacon. And they even blame God for the shortcoming. Church folk, they cringe in fear when the devil rears his ugly head. And it's always at the most inopportune times because they only call out the name of Jesus when other um, church folk can hear them. They haven't developed a relationship with the Prince of Peace, so they don't rest like the saints who know that God has given his people sweet, sweet. We don't pace the floor worrying and fret because God's God. God's children know we have God. We have a great intercessor. And you know what? Children of God are led by the Spirit of God. Yes, we're all sinners saved by grace. At that very instance of salvation, the child of God receives the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And when he comes in, he does so to abide with the new believer forever. And when the Spirit of God comes into a life, that life is changed forever. We're a new creature in Christ. But we have to pay special attention to those words in Christ. Because it's Jesus that's the one that makes all the difference. Because you can be a good person and you can still die lost. But when you're in Christ, you're saved from eternity and eternity of hell. Jesus is the only refuge and the only place we can find forgiveness, hope, and everlasting love. Those who have trusted Jesus will walk under the leadership of the Holy Spirit and will not be controlled by the will of the flesh. It doesn't mean we're perfect after salvation, only that the Lord will be in the process of perfecting us in this world and that we will be in cooperation with him. We need to understand that we need to be in cooperation with him as he works in us. The result of how good or not good you are, or whether you have it ready or not, it's all up to who? It's all up to us. Jesus has done all that he can do. We need to walk it out. Lost sinners, because we're all sinners now. Lost sinners are under the control of three masters. The flesh, the world, and the devil. Some lost sinners are led to lives of wickedness and evil. And we can see them in the newspaper and talk about it. Like, did you see that? Did you see that evil man? But you know what? Other sinners, other lost sinners, you know what they, where they are? They're good church members. They're outstanding citizens. But they're all going and heading to the same hell. Amen. Amen. But there's hope. When Jesus comes into a life, he changes everything. Now, in him, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we're delivered from the bondage of flesh, the devil, and the world. We live a new life in Jesus, who has given us the tools we need to live a holy life for his glory. We just have to use the tools he's already given us to say no to sin and yes to the Spirit. Help us, Lord. Children of God, I'm a child of God. I thank God that we know that we've already been healed. And we're just waiting on the manifestation sometimes. Children of God don't care how God's going to make it happen. They just trust that it will. By his stripes, we were healed. Already done. Already done. It's already done. We have humbled ourselves, prayed, sought his face, returned from our wicked ways. Now he's heard from heaven and he's healed our land. God wants us to be in good health even as our soul prospers. But if the manifestation of healing isn't noticeable immediately, or it doesn't transpire as quickly as we would like, then we still keep the faith. We still keep the faith. We still love him, and we recognize that we are only here because of his grace. And we acknowledge that he is a sovereign God. So I thank you, Father, for my healing. Now, church folk, they try to put God in the box and try to tell him, 
try to tell God what has to happen. If they're sick, they believe that it's just part of living. They believe they'll only be healed after they seek some medical attention. And they forgot that the only true healing comes from God. True healing comes from God. I'm not talking just about your physical body. I'm talking about your mind. I'm talking about your heart. I'm talking about relationships. I'm talking about your spiritual well-being. God can heal it all. But Jesus, thank you, Jesus. We know that God is the great physician. We thank you for healing this world. If we were, if we were those church folk, though, <coughs> do y'all remember in the Bible when Jesus spat on the clay and he spat? Well, he, I don't think he just spit. I think he really, he really spit into that dirt, and he put it on that man's eyes, and he was healed. Church folk don't and turn up their face, walk away. I know he did. It don't take all that. <laughs> we need to stop saying it don't take all that. It takes all that anything. When you see something that is miraculous, you need to go ahead and rejoice and dance for joy because healing is real. You know, church folk, they want things on only their turn. They don't want anybody to praise God except for how they personally praise God. But I'm going to tell you, just because I shout, I don't expect you to shout. Just because I leave, I don't expect you to leave. But if I feel running in my feet, I'm going to run. Because of what God has done for me, I don't care what you think about what I'm doing. Yes, yes. 
Yes. If I'm standing yeah. here and I'm crying, maybe I'm just so grateful about something that God has done for me.
You don't want to taste death, but you want to live eternally with him. Yeah. You love him and you worship him for who he is. You are no surprise to God. Not only does he know the number of hairs on your head, he knew you before you were born in the womb. He knows all your faults, your issues, your shortcomings, your secret sins. But he still loved you enough to send his son to die on the cross. All to be able to receive you into his kingdom. If you confess Jesus as your Savior, then he needs to be your Savior. And he needs to be your Lord. But if you confess Jesus as your Savior because you were just scared you were going to hell, but don't see him as your master because you refuse to submit your will to his will, then your salvation is in question. You don't want to hear that, but it's the truth in you. Jesus should be master. You should submit your will to his will. You can't come to God seeking salvation if you don't want to become a new creature in him and to serve him. You can't fake your way into the kingdom because you can't fool him, you can't scam, you can't bamboozle him. He sees right through our, to all of our ulterior motives and all of our agendas. The question is, do you really love him? Have you been born again of his spirit? Not the spirit of something else, but his spirit. If you have any doubt or uncertainty about where your eternity will be spent, then God's loving arms are reaching out right now to embrace you and call you to repentance. Ask God right now to create in you a clean heart so that you can become committed to your walk of faith. It's a faith walk. We have to trust Him. Some of us, we just all churched out and get tired of church as usual. You are the church. Don't you know that your body is a temple? Do you not know that? God is relying on us to do what he called us to do. But we cannot do it dipping and dabbling in sin. We are not of the world. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of church as you. And is anybody tired of church as usual?
right now is for you to spend some time in the Word and go closer to it. You need a personal revival that comes only from one-on-one, -on -one, you and Daddy God time. Even Jesus had to take time to be alone with the Father. So draw nigh unto him, and he will draw nigh unto you. And he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. So step out on that mustard seed of faith and be who he called you to be. He loves you, church. He's calling you to be led by the Spirit of God so he can consider you his child. You need to receive the spirit of adoption and cry on the Father. And that's what we do now. We cry all the Father because he is our dad and we love him. Hallelujah. I stand and praise his holy yes. and wonderful name. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.